All right. Uh, come on, Charlie. Good morning. Good morning, Charles. Yes. What's going on, man? It's been pretty good. First <laughs> Samuel seven. First Samuel chapter seven. Right, first Samuel chapter seven. Okay, today we're going to look at the last judge of Israel. Right. Last judge before they actually go into. I know it is. <laughs> First so Samuel seven. Uh, go down. Oh, I'm looking at second Samuel. That's why I'm like, that's weird. So, was your assertion last week, Charlie, that Ruth, that Ruth is a judge? No. Actually, there wasn't one during that time. Uh, it would have been either, as far as, they, they could have been as far ahead as in the Gideon's time, mm -hmm. uh, or it could have been between uh, Othniel and Ehud, in, in the, either under the tail end of one of their reigns as, as judge. To, to, as far as everything that I look at in the charts, um, the chronology, it seemed like it, they would they would have fit one of those two times. And then under. you were emphatic that, um, unless expressly stated, there are no types of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, I just have a hard time personally being able to see those. So you think there, it's okay for anybody else just to make up the ones? No, I mean, it just kind of like, I mean, I guess it feels good, and it's cool, but <laughs> unless expressly stated, it's like, I don't see where there's a like direct point to be uh, made from, or uh, truths to be drawn out unless it's specifically, uh, well, like within Galatians, uh, where we're given about Abraham and Satan, Hagar. Uh, that's that's explicitly stated as being one, and then that, uh, and what else to be learned from that specifically. I'm not saying there's others that aren't. I just I can't. <laughs> that's uh, that's not something. My mind doesn't work towards that. I have to. I'm more literal and concrete. When it gets into the figurative stuff, I that's like okay. That's to me. It sounds like oh, you're just making up stuff. Uh, Thank you. No, no, no. Okay, so First Samuel seven, First Samuel seven, and uh, go. Well, we'll start at verse one. Okay, and the men of Kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought into the house of Abinadab in a hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And then Samuel spake unto the, all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all, your, uh, with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord. And serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel from Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. They gathered together the Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day. And there, uh, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And when the, and when the Philistines heard the children of Israel, were gathered together the Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, and he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And then Samuel took a second lamb, offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord, and Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him, 
And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and Israel, or, and discomforted them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came unto Bethkar. And Samuel took a stone, set it between Mizpah and Shen, and called the name of Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and there they came no more into the coast of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Okay, so that's actually, actually going to be quite a long period of time, because at this point in time, Samuel is kind of basically middle age. And then, uh, verse 14, it says, The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even to the Gap, and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. There was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, uh, and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, and Gilgal, and Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. Okay. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. Okay, so we see him as an adult already way into his ministry here. Samuel, if we were to go back through the first few chapters, we see as an individual, he's not even a uh, Levite. Uh, he's from the tribe of Ephraim, uh, but he was given unto God. Actually, what had happened was, he comes from a dysfunctional family. Uh, his mom was one of two wives that the husband had, and in her case in particular, she was childless for a number of years. Now, they were actually faithful to go up to offer uh, sacrifices unto the Lord. Uh, uh, at where the tabernacle was set in Jerusalem, uh, but nevertheless, you know, <laughs> that's uh, that's still something that you know God's pretty clear about as far as that you know it shall be uh, two that become one flesh and not you know multiple that become you know how how you gonna how, <laughs> how you gonna become one flesh with more than one other person that's not you know whatever that's not God's will, but anyways, nevertheless they had been faithful to go up and offer sacrifices unto the Lord. And then Hannah, Samuel's mom, was one that was very, I guess, distressed of the fact that she didn't have a kid. And so she had prayed specifically for a man-child. Uh, not just a child, but she wanted a man-child in particular. And she said, God, if you give me a man-child, then I'm going to give him to you all the days of his life. And I'm going to make sure that there's not a razor that's going to come upon his head. So uh, that is similar to what would be a Nazarite vow that would have been on uh, not Gideon, um, <laughs> Samson. And then where he's not supposed to cut the hair of his head to kind of basically signify, okay, the, this guy is dedicated unto God for the whole of his life. And then, um, now it doesn't specify as to, okay, he's not to have any uh, strong drink or any fruit of the vine uh, come into his body but he was one that was wholly dedicated to God. And then we see that um, God blesses her and allows her to have a man-child, so she names him Samuel, uh, which basically means ask of God. And so she raises him until he's weaned, and then from there she gives him, brings him to the temple and gives him to, to well, the tabernacle, not the temple yet, but gives him, gives him to God, basically, and says, okay, here, you can have him. And so he's taken in, by Eli the priest, uh, who was somebody that was not um, very dedicated as a priest. Now, he did his duties, uh, but he had two children that were basically unruly and accused of riot. They were womanizing, they were stealing uh, of the offerings that were given uh, that were supposed to be for service of the Lord. But uh, God's, accusation, God's accusation towards them and including Eli was the fact that they made themselves fat with the offerings that were supposed to be unto God. So in other words, they, they embezzled and they're, they're thieves. Uh, they took more than what was their necessary fair share. And he pronounced judgment on them that they were going to die. Uh, and it speaks also of that time as being uh, in 1 Samuel 3 that it is a time where the word of God was precious and there was no open vision. Now the idea there of being that it's precious is that it's very rare. You know, in other words, it's hard to be found. Um, usually you think of precious as being something that is like, okay, well, it's got great value. Well, here, 
in part it's because it's not to be found. It's not. There wasn't. God wasn't specifically addressing uh, like all of Israel. Uh, he would only speak to certain people, and that was because nobody had a heart really to to want to follow God or to seek God. So by and large, Israel was back to their ways of. Uh, following after false gods and basically being in idolatry. Um, as is the time that you find Israel most of the time during this period in their history where um, they actually even after after they start the monarchy that they seek after things that really don't satisfy, don't fulfill. Uh, and then, But God speaks to Samuel in particular and as Samuel is growing up and this is even prior to him actually coming to know God personally uh, for, for salvation is that Samuel uh, as he's been trained by his mother even though he's in an environment where uh, it's probably not the best you would think okay this would be good that he's going to be in the house of the Lord but the person leaving the house of the Lord at that time was not somebody that would have been faithful um, nevertheless he himself was faithful to God and he it speaks of that uh, the Lord let not any of the words of Samuel fall so in other words, what he would speak would come to pass. And then it was recognized by all of Israel that Samuel was, wow, this guy's a prophet. Uh, and even and that was because God was with him. And that was because he was open and sensitive by means of the fact that he was, this is how he was trained. Huh? This is how he was brought up. Uh, and obviously he made personal choice that, hey, I'm going to follow God. So he was somebody that was sensitive to the leading of God. Uh, and God spoke to him. And therefore God used him. And for the whole of his life, he was somebody that would have judged Israel. Now, um, what I'd looked up is that he, we go to 1 Samuel 25, Samuel dies. Uh, and this is after, uh, we'll get ready to see this, but after um, Saul is elected king, and then Saul is also dismissed as being king, and then he's a uh, David is anointed king and then Saul is well into the years of him chasing David because he's envious of David's position now and wants to kill him uh, so he's able to live from seeing you know basically the ark of God being taken from the house of God house of God being raided uh, from when he was a youth to now uh, what we just read would have been Ark of God actually was sent back from the Philistines to Israel uh, because they were smitten with emeralds. They were diseased, basically, in their uh, private parts by God as a judgment for them having uh, basically handled the Ark and being with the Ark. So they sent it back and said, hey, we're, we're tired of this. Uh, we don't want to be stricken with this stuff. So they sent an offering as well with it and then it remained in this one area. Uh, and then he sees from that point until whenever Israel disobeys again uh, with seeking out, um, wanting to have a king put over them so that they could be like everybody else. Uh, and then so that was approximately roughly the span of time in which he lived would have been about 52 years. So not, doesn't seem like very old, okay. Uh, but he was able to see a lot done within that time, and then the whole of his life basically was spent uh, as somebody that would have served God. And then, as it says here, that he judged Israel uh, for the whole of his life. Uh, so he was used of God uh, to bring about, at least within the measure of his ability could, and their willingness to want to respond to God, uh, righteousness, to rot righteousness within Israel, to lead them to God. Uh, so here's a man that wholly dedicated from his youth basically he's given to God he's actually he's, the only reason he's born is because uh, his mom prays to God and then makes a vow to God saying hey I'll give my son to you if you uh, give me a son to begin with and then you know God hears answers blesses with her being able to, to conceive and then <laughs> he trains him up, gives him to God, and then he spends the rest of his life. Now, unfortunately, go to um, chapter 8. 
chapter 8, verse 1. It says, It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, uh, but turned aside after lucre, okay, with basically money, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Okay, and then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge over us like all these nations. Okay, the thing displeased Samuel, and they said, uh, when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and then the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people um, in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Um, and according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also now unto thee. And then, you know, it tells them basically, therefore hearken unto their voice, how be it, yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Okay, so he's going he's to do that. Interesting. Who would want that kind of leadership to lead them? I mean, you got guys that, it says here, they pervert judgment, they take bribes, and they're turned aside after lucre. So, I mean, their heart is set on money. And they People are the same. People who have those same characteristics. It's very easy to overlook a fault in someone when it's one that you're looking yourself. The, what's funny though is God says that uh, they haven't rejected him, but they've rejected, well, in other words, they haven't rejected Samuel, but they've rejected him. Um, he could have actually dealt with them, killed them off, or he could have done some other thing, but the fact was God's plan was for them to have them as leadership. Yes? What is the difference between Eli and his sons and Samuel and his sons? Because they're both disobedient, but yet God made sure that Eli's sons were killed. Though Eli was not doing correctly, because I know he was taken of the fat of the sacrifices and eating it, where Samuel was still close to the Lord. But there was a difference in the way God handled them. God didn't kill Samuel's sons. Their, his family ended pretty tragically, though. Yeah. With Remember when Saul killed all the priests? The, um, one main distinction that I would draw um, Eli specifically is indicted by God saying that you haven't you've, you let it go like in other words you find this acceptable you may, you may act as if you're displeased or disgusted by what what's going on but basically you've, you're a partaker with them of what they do mm -hmm. Um, he says they've all made themselves fat with, with, from the offering. So he might have, okay, been partaker with them. He may not have been womanizing necessarily, but the fact was he's still just as guilty or culpable because he didn't really, he, he's like, oh, I would say probably his attitude might have been, oh, well, boys will be boys. Or he's like, oh, you know, whatever, let them have their way or whatnot. And so they, um, God saw it as he was just as guilty here. Um, they turned aside, so at some point they made a choice. So maybe we're presuming that um, when Samuel found out about it, he went and talked to his kids. We don't have a recorded account. I mean, it's not recorded, but how Lord's handling this is kind of, it's different. Initially, yeah. Okay. But they were, they're, the, you're going to, wait. Well, as Pastor brought up later on down when uh, David's on the run from Saul, uh, you're going to have the 
all killed off. Uh, and then he's going to initiate another priesthood. Um, also, in particular, God had said that not only was he going to kill uh, Eli and his sons, but basically his, his lineage, and he's going to raise himself up another priest that would follow God. And so he's from that point forward, it's like, okay, anybody that's going to be in Eli's bloodline is going to be wiped out altogether. Um, but that's one of my points here, was I was going to bring up, is that, uh, well, hi, good morning. We're good. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and mention it now then. So, um, here's what we can learn from Samuel with regard to him being a judge. Uh, and I'll, I'll just skip from where I had it, and that is that you, though you come from, <laughs> though you come from a messed up environment or messed up background, you don't have to repeat the sins of your father. In other words, you can take a different route, a different direction. Now, he personally was somebody that was close to God, and he was somebody that followed God, that walked with God. Uh, obviously was used of God uh, but it seems like he fell into the same pattern <coughs> with uh, with what he had learned from Eli uh, as far as being a father um, again it's very crucial in Proverbs 22 6 that you know train your child in the way you should go and when he's old you will not depart from it um, of the things that you can fault Samuel for, that seems to be one of the only things that really kind of stands out. Uh, and even then, it's not brought forth as an indictment from the Lord necessarily. It's just mentioned that his sons turned aside after filthy lucre. Now, they weren't womanizing necessarily, but it's still wicked that they were turned aside and they would take bribes. To, uh, well, I'm sorry, we're in First Samuel uh, chapter 8. First Samuel chapter 8. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, <coughs> you don't have to follow, and you can break that chain, or you can break that cycle. That wasn't his family. In other words, his own family was, a, you know, dysfunctional as well. Uh, now, interestingly enough, his mom was blessed after his birth. In other words, she was going to have five other kids. She's going to have two daughters and three sons after Samuel. So he had siblings, as far as his own bloodline, his own blood family. But he was given over to God, and he was raised basically in effect. <coughs> Initially by his mom, and then after that following, it would be Eli that he would come to follow and walk, you know, under. So he didn't have to follow in Eli's footsteps as far as how he dealt with his kids. He he was there to see the outcome. He was there specifically used as a prophet, <laughs> as a little kid, to tell Eli, this is what's going to happen to your family. And then Eli had to, like, urge him, you know, tell him, hey, what, what did God tell you? And then he told him, this is what God told me, that, you know, your kids are all going to get killed off. And as a sign for what I'm going to do in wiping out your bloodline, basically, is that uh, your kids are going to die all on the same day. And then we see it's going to come to pass uh, later on, whenever the Philistines come and attack, and they take the Ark of God, and then they raid the house of God. And so his two sons are killed. Uh, you have one of the son's daughters uh, give birth that day. And then they called the child uh, Ichabod, saying the glory has departed. So, and then even Eli dies that very same day. Uh, he's leaning back on his chair, and he falls back because of the shock. They're hearing, okay, the Ark of God has been removed, and then he breaks his neck uh, during the fall. Uh, so God's, God's word comes to pass. The fact is, you, just because you come from, from a mess background or because you have a bad environment, just because you have, it seems like, none or very little of the resources necessary to be quote unquote successful or become something uh, later on down. So just because you don't have that doesn't mean that you can't. Okay, you don't have to follow in the footsteps of the, the negative or the bad that you see around you. Okay, um, and that, That's pretty clear. Samuel himself didn't, but he didn't do a good job in being able to lead his kids. They still follow after filthy lucre. Uh, another thing was Related to that, uh, he judged Israel. Um, he sought for them to want to have a heart for God. Uh, and he was actually personally used by God 
not only in obviously the life of those around him immediately as a young child and then as middle age and then even as when he was older when you had Saul uh, chasing after David and after they call for a king and then God you know concedes to them to give him a king um, he's prophet to them he anoints David and then if we were to go to chapter 30 and then even chapter 31 in 1 Samuel that act, he dies in chapter 25 and then 30 and 31 Saul uh, go, let's go there real quick <clears throat> Thirty thirty one is what I'm thinking as far as when he died. Um, go to twenty eight. Actually, twenty eight is where I'm thinking of. Um, verse verse one. It said, "It came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel, and Achish unto David. Um, and Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle thou and thy men. And then David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know that what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, uh, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Okay, now Samuel was dead, and all Israel lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. And then um, Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. Uh, Skip down to verse 7. And it said, And then Saul said unto a servant, Seek me a woman to have a familiar spirit, that I may go unto her and inquire of her. And his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman uh, that hath a familiar spirit in Endor. Okay, and then Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and went down and, uh, and two men. Uh, skip down. <coughs> skip down to verse 15. Um, and then Saul said to Sam, and then Samuel said to Saul, why hast, thou, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered him, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answered me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. And then, <laughs> Then Samuel said, Wherefore didst thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy? Uh, and the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom from out, of, uh, out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest uh, his fierce wrath upon the Amal upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee uh, this day. Okay, and the more will the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee, into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow thou, thou and thy sons uh, shall be with me. Uh, the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Okay, and then you know Saul fell straightway along, all along the earth, and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day and all the night. All right, Saul's already dead. Or excuse me, Samuel's already dead. So this is actually Samuel's spirit. Uh, that's come up. He went, uh, Saul had, this is funny, Saul's reasoning when he talks to Samuel and actually Samuel and responds to him. God's left me. I'm not getting any answers from anybody. I don't know where to turn to, so I came to you. That's why. Okay. Now, this is in part a testimony to, Sam, to the fact that Sam, uh, Samuel was close to God and Samuel was being used of God. Uh, now, it wasn't God's plan necessarily for him to be brought up of his spirit out of paradise to speak to Saul. But nevertheless, uh, when he was in trouble, when he was distressed, okay, who do you turn to? Well, you turn to the man of God. Here's the guy that uh, is close to God, knows how to communicate with God, speaks to God.
God doesn't let any of his words fall to the ground. Um, and so the fact is, we in like manner, uh, it's not that, okay, our spirits are going to be called out from, you know, heaven if we pass before God, you know, before the Lord returns and we're raptured. Um, but nevertheless, as far as he being dead yet speaketh, uh, like it tells us in Hebrews 11, the fact that we have a testimony that could carry on and carry forward as far as the fact that, hey, now, yeah, okay, God was with us, but the fact is that it glorifies God. People need to go if they wanted answers from God or if they wanted to hear from God. Uh, by the way, they themselves could be as close to God as they wanted to be. Uh, it's kind of a shame and it's a testimony to the fact that they don't really have a heart for God. That It's not that you don't turn to somebody that is godly or close to God for advice. You should seek that. Uh, but the fact is God wants to develop you and wants to draw you and uh, strengthen you so that you yourself are developed and grown to where you can go to God on your own. Um, in our time period presently, the uh, Bible speaks of us being kings and priests before God. And that was, uh, I don't need a go-between because of what Christ has done. Christ is the one that is the mediator. He's the intercessor. He's the one that uh, is between God and I. He's broken down the middle wall partition, so now I am able to go to God directly as a result. And then that's why we're admonished in Hebrews 4 that we're supposed to come boldly before the throne of grace. And that is because I have access, I have direct access to God. And then also that in Hebrews 10, that we can draw an eye with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Uh, because of the fact that, and that's God's desire for us. Uh, I don't need, you know, a pope or some other man or a woman or has a case may be, you know, I don't need another somebody to go between before me. Now, obviously, we should be intercessors for people. Uh, but the fact is, you know, you can, you can be as close to God as you want to be. Uh, and then Saul, in his disobedience and in his state of confusion, he knew where to go. And that was, okay, go like that. Um, what's sad, though, is that as it happened was that his position of where he was uh, was as a result of his disobedience. So... What he should have done, as far as in his response, was acknowledge the fact that God had called David, had taken the kingdom from him, and as he had said he was going to do, and that he should submit himself, okay, well, David, if you're going to be king, here. And then do everything in his power as far as to facilitate that being the case, rather than oppose it uh, out of bitterness and envy. Okay, so, lesson that we can learn from Samuel, you can be as close to God as you want to be, uh, two, you don't have to let your environment dictate your outcome. Uh, you can be somebody that is, as far as successful as in God's eyes, you can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, regardless of what you have over you. And as far as people that are either encouraging or you or discouraging you. Um, now Samuel, I don't think would have been necessarily held back by Eli, but he certainly was not, I would say, motivated positively by Eli's testimony. It would have been something that, like, well, I don't want to turn out like him, so I better work hard. Uh, but, you know, seeing, you know, Eli's sons doing what they're doing, uh, to me, that would be something that would be disheartening. But that's not God's fault. That's not God's leading. And in spite of that, he himself was close to God and he was able to go ahead and be used of God. Uh, third thing is also that uh, we're told in Galatians that uh, whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. He, though, was a bad parent. Um, his kids turned out wicked, the fact was he did lead many to righteousness, and he did, uh, well, he wrought righteousness within Israel. He led them to God. Uh, and when they cried out after 20 years of not having the ark within Israel, really, within where it was supposed to be, they cried out and they said, okay, hey, um, you know, we want the ark back. And so he, he 
calls out to them, hey, if you turn your hearts back to God and then leave your idols, you know, then we'll see what God's going to do. God will deliver. Uh, but until you do that, you're not gonna, you're not going to be uh, anywhere where God's going to, you know, be anywhere near y'all. Yes. I'll just let you finish your sentence. No, go ahead. Well, uh, Mrs. Ellen's really kind of brought up a pretty good contrast between the uh, outcome of Saul. I mean, I saw uh, Samuel versus Eli, and the parallel one would be Saul and David. You know, really, in act, there was nothing more wicked about what Saul did than what David had done in his lifetime. And several times David came under harsh judgment of God. But the, the major contrast and the difference between David and Saul was that David humbled himself and that he repented. And you know, it's it's really interesting when you just look at different individuals like we were talking about a, a few weeks ago with, with um, individuals that dishonored God with their with their offerings. You look at like Ananias and Sapphira and God killed them and then you, you look at Nadab and Bihu and and then there are other individuals that, like Saul, that survived. You know, God didn't kill him. And again, the thing that you pointed out is, <laughs> I think we're really focused on mortality and the parameters of the life that we live on this earth. And eternity is really much more of a reality than the short life that we live here. It's it's so much more vast in its scope. And you know, the, the idea that this life ending is the ultimate in judgment isn't actually. That that final separation from God is the ultimate in judgment. And so yes, maybe God would say on this earth, you're finished here. Whatever the span of those years is. For some it's childhood, for others it's old age. But what really difference is it five years or a hundred years when we're going to live forever? And uh, God has not forgotten anything. There's nothing left unjudged. So I don't know. I think as, as she mentioned that, I've been reflecting on that reality. And there's some really helpful application there for us in just how we think. We just think so much about this life and the things that are so temporary and we because we put, invest so much thought and so much concern into that of course then we do the opposite for things that are eternal so there's just always that constant good reminder for us to be eternally minded I was just going to say too uh, like concerning Eli's sons and Samuel's sons too and God knows how to deal with whom and when and how and yeah. such. So we just trust in God. I think in some instances, death is merciful. Mm. <laughs> yes, ma'am? Well, uh, the Bible says here that uh, <coughs> Samuel said to Saul that he and his sons were going to be where he was. Yes. Now, where was Samuel? He was paradise. paradise. Now, there were two places at that time. Paradise and yeah, hell. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so does that mean that uh, he was going to be in paradise? Yes. So he was saved, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, and also I've heard people say about uh, uh, King Solomon. Because uh, you wonder if he was saved, and I've heard people say that he was. What do you think, Pastor? Oh, I know he was saved. Okay. Yeah, God's, God's presence came down into the temple that he built. Oh, God right. accepted that. Yeah, right. You know, mm -hmm. so his heart was turned away to worship mm -hmm. idols, but he was saved. Saved people are, are capable of incredible atrocities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> as terrible as he ended his life, by the way, he didn't have to end up like that. Um, it seems like each disobedience that he had uh, committed just led to worse, and that was as a result of his responses. Uh, 
I'll finish with this basically as when he pointed, as Pastor pointed out the contrast between Saul and David. David actually didn't end that well necessarily. He ended close to God himself personally, but his family was a wreck. He ruined his family because of really bad decisions earlier and sinful choices that he had made. But he himself was close to God. Um, and somewhere in there, Solomon was introduced to God. Yeah. And then you have Saul, who, I mean, Samuel had told him that, you know, well, actually, God had, through Samuel, um, you know, when that was little and not on sight. But basically, he kind of puffed up, and then he became envious and bitter um, over God's dealings. Um, and he responded foolishly rather than follow through and be obedient to God. Uh, and each, each time he was disobedient and the judgments started getting worse. Uh, and then he just was like, okay, forget it, I'm done. And to God, okay, I'm through. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't have to go out like that. He could have, God was still going to fulfill and follow through on what he said he was going to do regardless, but I'm just saying like he could have, he could have submitted himself over to the will of God. Uh, and like Peter tells us, as unto a faithful creator. You know, he could have at least not destroyed. Well, he ruined a lot of lives. He hurt a lot of people as a result. Uh, and then I, th I think he was killed prematurely as a result of that, as a, as a result of judgment. You know, he could have had a longer life. But at any rate, he didn't have to end up like that. And that was, that was you know, so when you're chastised by God, when you're judged by God, the fact is, is you respond by breaking. Uh, David did. He was restored. He still had damage, you know, that would last. And then there was going to be bloodshed in his household. The sword was not going to depart from it, and a number of other things. But nevertheless, he still, he still, uh, and God, as God still working in the lives of, of those that follow. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Okay, now we're dismissed. Thanks, Charlie. Welcome back. I keep thinking you need to I remembered. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Very nice to see you. I tried calling you a while back, but your cell phone number changed. I did. Somebody stole my purse. Okay. And we got it back. We prayed and got it back. But in the meantime, I had gotten a different Okay. Yeah, I did try to call you a while back and left yeah. the message, but yeah, well, your number is different, so yeah. good to see you. Yeah. Welcome yeah. back. I wish, Rick, uh, I wish Jose and Eduardo were here. I do too, or where are they at? Yeah.